we are really happy to having you here today for a great conversation with two fantastic experts. And today's subject is a very special one because I mentioned this kind of Hollywood narrative of great men and their heroic actions with Burt Lancaster starring uh, Napoleon or Caesar. It is, there has been a priority to the visual in our conception of history. The portraits of our great leaders, the buildings, the castles, the cities, the objects, crowns, uniforms. So we have a certain automatic way of understanding history with our eyes. And our experts today have been studying if sound can play a role in in relevating the historic truth. So we are very much looking forward to listening to Louis Shutsukai here from Boston, who has been exploring sounds and Emik Bar Okpo in Berlin. And yeah, looking forward to the next 90 minutes. I hand over to my colleague, Annette, who has been carefully preparing this wonderful program. And I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Christoph, and hello to you all. Thank you all for coming. As Christoph mentioned, we've invited two guests, Luis Chudesoki and Emeka Ogbo, to join us for a conversation on the role of the auditory in listening to history. Both will start by presenting their work and giving us input for the conversation. And we'll begin with Luis Chudesoki, who is joining us from Boston today. Luis is a professor at Boston University where he teaches English and a chair and the chair and director of the African American Studies program. He's a scholar and award-winning author and he's written extensively on literary, political and cultural phenomena of the African diaspora. Perhaps a little lesser known is his work around sound architecture and trauma. He's the founder of the Sonic Art and Archival Project Echolocution and he is director and curator of a new project funded by the German Federal Cultural Foundation, which investigates the former Nazi party rally grounds in Nuremberg in collaboration with invited sound artists from outside Germany. Luis pre-recorded his presentation here at the Goethe Institute Boston. It will last around 10 minutes and we will share it with you now. We should, of course, be familiar with not just the parallels between American racism and Nazism, but the exchanges at work between National Socialist Race Science, as established by the infamous Nuremberg Laws, and the political and cultural systems of Jim Crow racism and state-sponsored xenophobia in the United States. As I'll discuss in a bit, there's also a strong link between Germany, colonial ethnography, and early sound recording. Now these historical ref uh, resonances are unavoidable and in fact necessary, but my work with these different contexts was in a sense accidental. They're not actually what led a project based on field recordings in the African diaspora to Germany. The Echolocution Project began as a response to various attempts by artists, critics, activists, scholars, to engage national projects of memory and memorialization, particularly around issues of race, empire, and trauma. Ranging from tearing down statues to the renaming of sites and institutions, from the revising of educational curricula to even debates about reparations, these attempts all confronted history by way of its public representations or misrepresentations. Because of their focus on how history is represented, a lot of these responses and projects are inevitably rooted in textual or visual media or spaces such as monuments. This is understandable given the primacy of the visual in Western culture, but also the context of state memorialization, which leaves visual traces and texts, you know, buildings, ruins, flags, statues, artifacts. Echolocution, however, acknowledges that to use the visual to challenge the visual or to use text to argue against text seeds ground 
and amputates history. History and memory, after all, are more than just visual traces, artifacts, statues, ruins, or real estate, as are nations and traumas. These things are experiential, psychological, immaterial, yet at the same time embodied. So the project is rooted in my research and writing on two particular themes, race and technology. Or to be more specific, black people and their engagement with technology from colonialism and slavery all the way to the present. Now I've argued in my work that what brings blacks and technology together most intimately over the course of the last centuries has been in fact music, but to be more specific, sound recording. That's an area in which blacks have inarguably made a significant and global impact, even amidst racism, violence, and relentless arguments about their biological, cultural, or intellectual inferiority, or arguments about their lack of technological acumen. In my work, I hear black music as being less about music, melody, lyrics, rhythm, but instead about informatics, programming, technological transfer and reproduction, and the creation of space. And by focusing on those things, I was able to then isolate sound as what we're really talking about when we talk about blacks and recorded sound. This then led me in my writing and research to argue that one of the things that black people have bequeathed to the world via their musical forms are specific techniques of listening of making space and meaning by way of sound. Now it might go without saying, or at least without uh, the need for much strenuous argument, that music conveys history. It's a bit of a cliche. Not just historical details, but also a consciousness of history and modes of remembering. As ethnomusicologists would all affirm, melodies are patterns of thinking. Rhythms are modes of entraining oneself into techniques of collective recollection. And this goes from cultural habits and styles to stories and cliches. We learn how to do those things through such patterns and through music, right? Sound is also crucial to the invention of virtual spaces that replicate or signify community or belonging. Now, having mentioned ethnography and ethnomusicology, it's worth identifying another reason why my work led to Germany. This has a lot to do with race, history, colonialism, and trauma. And that is the history of field recording as a practice. Field recording as a colonial and racial practice of technology and listening. Since 1900, for example, Berlin has been the home of the Berliner Phonogram Archive, a collection of ethnomusicological field recordings, versions of what would eventually be called world music in the wake of what scholars in the 19th century, what they call the Berlin School of Comparative Musicology in the late 19th century. In the wake of that, we have the Berlin Phonogram Archive. Now, Germans didn't invent field recording or even colonialism or even race science, but they brought these methods of containment and control together in notable ways. Field recording, for example, is a practice that emerges out of technological encounters between colonialists and natives, whites and blacks, and also through the archiving and reproduction of ethnic sounds at the very birth of sound recording. That impacts our listening and our thinking about culture and race to the present. So upon being invited to do, to do a residency in Berlin late last year, I was invited to Nuremberg to work with a notable collaborator who was based in both cities. Now, of course, Nuremberg has a complex history, right? My collaborator then suggested that the Echolocution Project might benefit from sonically exploring the city's history and its spatial properties. Again, we all know that that city has an important history. In fact, that history of Nuremberg has been imprinted on the world by way of momentous architectural spaces and totemic visual icons. Now, I was reluctant 
given my place within my own contested and complicated diaspora. But with my collaborators' encouragement and my acknowledgement that all diasporas intersect and that sound operates by way of resonance and cross pollution, I began doing some preliminary field recordings with him and his team of remarkable students in Nuremberg. In the wake of that visit came a quite significant award by the noted German Federal Cultural Foundation to direct a project focused on the sonification of the Nazi sites in Nuremberg. Echolocution is also born out of the work of black artists who begin to appropriate what we call the prosthetic ear of sound recording within two decades of the establishment of the Berlin Phonogram Archive. With the development of microphone technology over the 20th century, field recording then becomes as much about recording the sounds of the racial other as it becomes about recording other spaces. Field recordings in that context start to move from the realm of ethnography and anthropology into the space of art. But in my view, it should never be divorced entirely from its origins in colonial and racial encounters. This then is how I came to start making field recordings of spaces and sites in the African diaspora that are associated with historical trauma. Because as the great field recordist Chris Watson has said, events haunt spaces. Events haunt spaces. Another way of saying that to me is that history contaminates place. And in my mind, there is no greater or more powerful way of experiencing hauntings, contaminations, place, and history than by listening. Listening is a posture that generates an awareness of space and time, but not necessarily fact or argument. This latter point is crucial because for me, sound enables a questioning of what history does or is meant to be. Because listening to space, particularly politically charged spaces, offers a strange, profound placelessness, a strange ambiguity that is not ambivalent, but can be troubling for those who insist that history or memory be exclusively on their side. As I like to say, music can be claimed, but sound cannot be owned. It doesn't demarcate clear positions. Sound is therefore always in tension with conventional archives and ideologies because it is always about something and somewhere and someone else. For the field recordist, space is not empty or immaterial. For example, sound travels differently in different temperatures due to humidity and types of atmosphere. And so silences vary as much as noises do. Sound enters the body differently, depending on location, reverberates there differently. Microphones operate differently, and so echo and reverb, for example, or even equalization are affected by location and place. What then are the cultural effects of these differences? Not only in terms of how people in different areas produce sound, music, language, narrative, reverb, echo, but how do they differently relate to space and memory? How do they listen? How did they listen? Are there traces or echoes of their listening? Is there value to listening to their listening? What can we learn if we listen to spaces that are dense with political, historical, mythical, and ideological meaning? What if we take those sonic materials and use them to supplement and challenge conventional archives? That's the goal of Echolocution and History is Listening, the larger project. The goal here is to really find out what does history sound like? Thank you so much, Luis, for that very thoughtful and well-organized presentation. Uh, it gives us much food for thought and a lot of input for the conversation. Uh, but first, we move on to our second guest, Emeka Ogbo, who's joining us from Berlin today. Emeka was born in Nigeria, where he continues to live and work part-time. 
He's known for artworks in which he explores how private, public, collective memories and histories are translated and encoded into sound and food. And through these works contemplates how auditory and gustatory experiences can frame our understanding of the world. And this provides a context in which to ask critical questions, some of which we'll be asking today on things like immigration, globalization, and post-colonialism. Emeka has presented his art in numerous international exhibitions, including Documenta 14, Sculpture Project Münster, and the Venice and Descartes Biennales. He's also exhibited a long list of museums and galleries, including the Cleveland Museum of Art and the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. And he was also already commissioned by the Tate, Gal Tate Modern and was a finalist for the prestigious Hugo Boss Prize in 2017. Emeka will be presenting live, uh, also around 10 minutes. And Emeka, if you're ready, I will hand over to you. I'm sorry, uh, this is really a traumatic uh, times for any Nigerian at the moment. And um, I, I already did a, a presentation prior to this of what I wanted to talk about, not this per se, but the events of the last few days um, has had me traumatized, I'm, I'm sure, so are uh, other Nigerians, because um, there's been this demonstration going on in Nigeria and SARS. And uh, after our um, discourse on uh, um, two days ago, the army moved into this place and shot, shot people up. And since this talk is about spaces, historical trauma, I, I, I thought the best thing to do is to present um, recordings, field recordings that went on during the shooting and after the shooting, but that were recorded in this space. It's also to bring to the attention what is going on at the moment. And I think it's very important that um, we talk about this. We're talking about trauma. We're talking about sound. We're talking about space. This uh, picture right here is the Lake Itoh Gate in Lagos, and this is where the demonstration uh, demonstrators camped out for a couple of days, um, asking the government to intervene to end this police special police unit that has been harassing them, and um, the government decided to send the army to shoot them in. So, if you're a very sensitive person, I'm sorry, probably switch off your speakers because I'm going to play for the next roughly 10 minutes audio excerpts that were recorded in this space of trauma, which is also historical now, according to the definition of history, is the study of past events, especially particularly in human affairs. This happened two days ago, so this space is historical. Um, Annette, could you switch uh, to the next picture and play the image and play the sound? Sorry. Thank <laughs> you. 
Olu Phillips is live in the lucky area of Lagos. Let's go to him now. Olu, what fresh information can you tell us now? IJ, what started some days ago as a peaceful protest, peaceful young people marching through the streets and making their voices heard has turned into a Black Tuesday here at the Lekki uh, Toll Plaza, which is just 100 meters away from me. Now, this place used to be well lit by the street light. Remember that we spoke live here from this spot at 5 p.m., telling the whole world that these people are still peaceful, sitting on the floor, and telling the whole world that they want their government to listen to them. And after that time, just a few hours after that time, when it came into darkness, um, the street lights went off and some folks approached uh, in uniform and opened fire. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to one or two persons who um, were very close to some of the firing range and what they have to say. Please, can you come? Tell us what exactly happened. Speak up. We are protesting peacefully. After a uh, comedian AY approached us, he addressed us. There was nothing. We were still uh, protesting peacefully without any violence at all. Immediately, the light, the street lights, they went off. People started shooting at us. We were, we were able to recognize them. They were putting on uniform. These were the military men, the soldiers. We, they, they, we were lying down, waving our flag, telling them they are protesting peacefully. But yet, they refused. They were shooting directly at us. It wasn't to, to drive us away, it was to kill us. Okay, I'm, I'm going to let him stop there. I'm going to bring someone else, IJ. This is live update and all our equipment are away. We had to make, imp uh, we had to improvise these systems. You can see, I have some, you can see, but I have a lot of folks, friends here in front of me, those who are protesting and they're pointing their torch lights, uh, phone lights on me to illuminate this place. Look at this one, for instance. He's conveyed a few people to the hospital and he's got, blood stains all over him. I'm going to ask him to step out again. I'm bringing someone else again. Look at this man. This is part of the damages that are happening here at the Lekki Toll. Now, IJ, if you think that is not good enough, IJ, look at this. Take a look at this. Take a look at this. Take a look at this. That's bullets. This is it. Bullets. These are evidences that people were shot. Earlier, I sent we saw some pictures that we sent in of someone who was shot on the tie. Two people have been taken to a hospital that we are aware of, but there are more than nine persons are receiving treatment in various hospitals across this place. This is what is happening here at Lake it all. Um, I have just a few minutes or few seconds to leave this place because we are now under a guarded area by some of these guys. And they assured me that I couldn't do this for more than um, three to four minutes. So IJ, the world, uh, Channels TV, uh, I mean, we are speaking live from the Lekki Toll Plaza. Allow us to leave now for safety because the military men are still around here. It's back to you, IJ. Thank you, Olu. Um, uh, I'm sorry. It's uh, come to the end and I'm, you know, I'm still traumatized about this. Uh, but, Louis, if you need a new space for recording of trauma and sound, we have a new space for you in Lagos. It's Lekki Toll Gate. And, uh, I'm an artist. I don't even know what to say or do. So I just thought it would be best to put these SFs together and present for this talk since we're talking about trauma, sound, and space. Thank you. I don't know about our listeners. Uh, to me, it was a very interesting experiment listening to your sounds, Emeka. Uh, we are not used to not watching for 10 minutes. This is something I learned. It was hard for me to just listen. And after two or three minutes, this kind of whole world opened up in a much more realistic way than in the CNN evening news. So it was a very interesting. Thanks for that, Emeka. So that's definitely something we learned today. So in a way, you gave an answer to our concept already. Well, Emeka at the end said that this is a space of trauma, certainly in the African world to add to the echolocution. It's of course difficult, not just because I'm also from Nigeria, but I'm just also aware of the level of increasing violence of state you know, forces um, all over the world um, here in the States. While, watch, while listening to this, and I'm glad we weren't watching that we were listening to it, 
I don't know that Emeka knows this, but one of the things that I've been trying to do with the Echolocution Project is also sourcing from people who were in all the Black Lives Matter protests all over the world and the anti-police brutality protests all over the world who've been recording it on their cell phones and gathering all this information just to share with each other, trying to source as much of that information as possible to create what I call the living archive. Because Christophe, your point about what it's like to just sit and dwell and listen is a powerful point because I think that is the challenge of this kind of material and why I think it's so important. So Emeka thinks, well, here's the, here's the sound, that's all I have to say. But I say, Emeka, that's more than enough, right? That's an entirely different experience of history happening right now. And so my question is what happens if, and this is not a question for Emeka, but this is the question that I ask with my work in sound, what happens if that's what we have access to when we experience the violence in Nigeria or the, the Black Lives Matter protests? What if what we're listening to get the story, right? Are these field recordings? What does that do as opposed to mainstream history and conventional attempts to spin it in certain ways? There's a certain power to this raw actual sound, which I find it hard to talk about because you know my family right now is busy trying to contact people in that area in Nigeria, right? So it's a difficult thing to confront history as it is lived, right? But the powerful thing though is indeed using sound to tell, I shouldn't even say tell a story, to just create a soundscape that generates different kinds of experiential and different experiences and meaning as you confront something that is very difficult to tell, right? And that's not much of an answer, but that's just a comment as I think about how this speaks to the sound recordings I'm listening to for the various Black Lives Matter and anti-police brutality um, protests all over the world, right? It's really stitching together a kind of symphony of where we are right now. But the problem for me is that this information is going to be ignored. <laughs> people are, it needs to be made central, right? Rather than just things that are on people's cell phones. Before I forget, you mentioned something about history um, before they start spinning it off, right? I mean, I'll tell you right now, the military is denying that this happened. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it's, I know the, the general was out there now and talking about like videos being photoshopped. This is audio recorded live in this space. People were living this trauma. You know what I mean? Real time. And you want to say it's, it's fake. I mean, I don't even have words for this, but you know, you, you know, you record space uh, where trauma happened very long time ago, where the, the Nazi sympathizers could deny, you know what I mean? Because the evidence may not be there, they could deny, you know, but this was recorded live mm -hmm. in this space and they're still trying to deny it. Mm -hmm. So field, you were asking me Annette, about soundscapes. I mean, this, I record soundscapes in real time. Like I see the city as a composer. The city is telling a story in real time. I record that. This is a story in real time. The city told that story. The people told that story. They recorded it in real time. This is why I work with soundscapes. You know, um, is this is the storytelling behind it? You know, how do we get attention to sound? I mean, the experiment you did with us, Emeka, was carefully crafted. We invited guys to join us. We led into that. And then you more or less forced us to listen and to shut our eyes. But normally this doesn't work in our visual world. So how can we, how do you in your work, Luis, you in your work, Emeka, get people from the usual visual into a more listening mode? The human being is really very visual, um, but I'll, you know, I'm sorry, man, it's quite emotional, but I'll just jump in quickly to say the first sense, one of the first senses or probably the first sense that was developed in humans is the, is the sense of hearing. After the first trimester, you could hear the sounds around the womb. So actually our sense of hearing is far more developed 
than the sense of seeing, which came later, right? With sound, I think we can all really hear. I mean, hearing is different from listening, but the visual distractions makes us want to focus more on the visual. So it really has to be like active, deep listening, paying close attention, like, you know, letting yourself be absorbed into the sound, be immersed into the sound. And, and then it unfolds, you know. I leave the Lagos, before I started recording, like I, I hardly paid attention to the sounds around me. But as soon as I started recording and listening, then I could tell the story of the city. I mean, the city tells a story every day from the recordings you do. You can tell how a city lives through these field recordings. But these are like sounds, everyday sounds you normally take for granted, you know, like, you know. <clears throat> so it's really, um, I think I think sound is the most powerful, um, one of the most powerful senses or the most powerful. Right now, just listening to this thing, we, are, we all went into this demonstration. It, it felt like we were there, you know what I mean? Like it felt this guy, these people having this narration, we're talking to us or like we're, right next to them, you know. If it was a video, it would be playing out on the screen while we are focusing on the screen and thinking it's, you know, it's, it's in a distance. But just listening to this, and if you had a headphone on, it felt like you were there right next to them. Like, you know, if, if, if I were to do this recording with binaural microphones, when the gunshot started and you had your headphones on, you probably knocked down thinking you're inside there. It's, it's so powerful, it's so strong, you know. I'm glad you just mentioned binaural, not to get too technical, but uh, the echolocution is not just recording historical sites, it's looking at contemporary sites of protest too. And it's difficult to sort of, uh, in the middle of such complicated political moments, theorize too much about the immediacy of what's going on. Trying to source these, inf these recordings from all over the world, particularly throughout the United States, and also protests on behalf of black people all over globally, right? Because we know the Black Lives Matter protests have been global, right? And recording them globally or getting those sources globally and hearing the different accents and the different issues that are coming up in terms of human rights and in terms of global racism and state power. The, through binaural recording, not only are you there, you're actually shook and terrified in a powerful way that rattles your understanding of what's going on, right? Um, I say this because back to your question, Christoph, what makes sound interesting for me is that sound is to a certain extent involuntary, right? There's the old cliche that people have with sound. They say that we have eyelids, but we don't have ear lids. Um, the power of sound is that it's really hard to not hear. <laughs> you have to work really hard to not hear. <laughs> you cannot read, and not see. And so the sound artists or people working with sounds and recordings and archives, they have the power of involuntary listening, right? And I just think that when it comes to history and things going on right now, part of our power and responsibility is to use that power of involuntary listening to get people to pay attention to what's happening, without question. I think Emeka's experiment made us travel distance. You brought us to Nigeria and uh, captivated us for 10 very long minutes. Louis, in your work, you also travel time. We've seen the photos of you sitting there in Nuremberg and the action in Nuremberg was 80 years ago. So how is it possible that today's sounds make us relive history? That's a tough one because as I said, I was encouraged to engage Nuremberg. I wasn't actively drawn to work in Nuremberg because my concerns are primarily in the African diaspora. But considering the history of Nuremberg, not only in terms of Nazism, but just in terms of propaganda, right? huge spaces, you know, imperial power. It made sense to try to convey just the experience of the space to a broader public. But to your question, I'm still trying to figure out the Nuremberg project as to what is going to happen with it. I honestly don't know. And so what I've done 
is I've invited sound artists from outside of Germany or from immigrant backgrounds or from the kinds of backgrounds that the Nazis would have viciously, violently silenced, <laughs> right? To, to work with me and create a response to those spaces through sound. Um, by the way, Emeka was the first person I reached out to, but his schedule doesn't allow, didn't allow him working in the Nuremberg Project. But he's the kind of person that we wanted on board to help figure out what to do with Nuremberg because the history of Nuremberg and Nazism is so totemically visual, right? Visual, whether it's Riefenstahl's films and the footage and the architecture. What do people who listen the way I listen and listen the way Emeka listens and um, Mendy and Keith Obadike, they're also involved. Yara Mekavai from Egypt, she's also involved. Right, Jan St. Werner and the DAF, they're all involved. What do we do when we listen to Nuremberg and what can we do then? So in terms of what we're trying to do in the long run, we don't quite know yet. We just need to descend and we've decided that listening is the posture and field recording is the technology. What will come out of that? is a part of the journey. To, to get to your question, um, Christophe, um, for me, reliving um, history through sound, um, uh, my main focus uh, wasn't like recording spaces like Louis, but like uh, finding archival sound of the moment where uh, at the point where I wasn't existing, I wasn't there. I wasn't like, for example, with the, with the Nazi history, I wasn't born then, right? But I see with sound, what sound does, like if you access an archive where you find recordings from that time, it puts you into that time. Sound is like a time traveler. You know what I mean? Like it immerses you into that time. If we probably had recordings of the Nazi activities then, much past whatever the propaganda speeches, audio and you kind of wear your headphones and, and, and uh, listen to this, it tra you travel back in time. You know, and my experience was also in the Berlin archives when I accessed the African recordings, you know, done with the, uh, with the Edison uh, uh, recorders back in the days, like uh, 1900s and stuff, uh, early, early 1900. Um, even if the sound wasn't clear, and most of these recordings, yes, they were probably kind of had colonial connotations like recording these uh, natives performing, dancing, singing, wherever. It, it took me to that time. You know, I started imagining the space. I started imagining this movement and the dances. And um, it takes you, it, sound, when you're immersed in sound, it's, it's really like time travel. So for me, it's, sound is, is like traveling back in time. And I'm making music at the moment and going through my recordings of Lagos. Um, the archives are the recordings I did like six, seven years ago in Lagos for my new album that I'm working on. And uh, Lagos has changed since then. It's not the same. It's just some of these bus stations are not the same anymore, but the sound takes me back. The recordings take me back to that time when it was like that, you know? So sound is like a time travel. Let me add to that what Emeka says and what you asked Christoph. In terms of archiving, Sound is time travel, but I think we are now capable of really in a sophisticated way, capturing spaces that we can then use for either pedagogical teaching methods or political methods or artistic methods. I think that we need to, this is what I'm committed to in a longer sense, start creating historical or cultural or political archives of spaces, right? I mean, if you know anything about, for example, convolution reverb and impulse response, which is what I started doing in Nuremberg, where we can now, for example, the project I'm doing is in the, the Nazi golden chamber. We can now digitally reproduce and then re, um, replicate and make accessible the space of the golden chamber, the Nazi private golden chamber. We can also create not just through reverb, but we can actually replicate spaces in the way we can replicate sounds, right? People tend to focus on it for either musical purposes, which is great, right? Or sound design, but what about historical purposes? Like the, the footage that Emeka has just presented us, 
right? I think that space and that immediacy should be always accessible to everybody globally, but certainly Nigerians and younger people to put them in that moment, right? If you're reading about what happened in Nigeria, for example, this week, it's gonna be a different experience if you're hearing it or reading it and juggling all of the official stories when you've got this actual footage there, right? I think that's very powerful. So I want an archive of spaces and events, historical as well as present, right? Talking of archives, um, Emeka, you mentioned the Berlin archives with colonial recordings. And uh, Luis, you've mentioned them in your talk as well. Are th is this archival material in a way contaminated through the colonial approach? I mean, you had these scientists from Berlin coming to African villages with concepts in their minds. So maybe the archive recordings are more an image of these researchers' minds than of real truth in African villages. So can you really, how do you work with these archival materials? You know, when you when you come into a, a place and choose to record certain things and leave out the others, you already have like a, a certain agenda that you want to achieve, you know. So um, when you just want to see these guys are just as just entertainers, like just uh, singing and dancing 24 hours. And uh, that is what you think it's uh, the best way to do an anthropological kind of research, you already have a, an agenda in that sense, you know? So um, when I record Lagos, I record everything. I record it over time. I'm not just gonna choose one. I'm not just gonna choose the, the nice places or I'm not just gonna choose one thing and focus and I'll leave the rest. In as much as I have spaces that I love recording for a particular reason, there's still, uh, you still have to have a, a broad kind of recording to talk about a place, right? They have the agenda as a, as a as colonialist coming to record Africa and, and all that. What I, found, what I find interesting with this recording and what works for me and why I overlook the colonial agenda is uh, the singing, the language, some of these languages as have evolved or some have I could be probably extend by now or not so many people speaking it. So it works for me on a different approach, you know, and um, I will also want to use these materials to, to create my works, not just sound installation, but maybe also music or things like that. But really, I, I am looking at it from the context of language and how the, some of these languages do not exist or some of the music being performed there do not exist. So I also have my agenda as an African uh, as a Nigerian that wants to uh, take a shot at history uh, that, that no longer exists. So everyone really has the agendas, but the, the colonial people that recorded this cannot just present this singing and dancing as a way of life of people. Like this is all they do. You didn't record any other thing. Um, you know, you didn't record the ambiences of those places. They are, they are you know, like they, they chose to do what they did. So there's, there's uh, everyone has their own agenda. I also have my agenda and what I want to do with this, you know. Right now, whether it's in the scholarly world or in the world of activism where people are tearing down statues and arguing that we rename certain things, et cetera, there's a real popular uprising against not just monuments, but archives, right? Who owns the past, the colonial past, right? Who for example, the Berlin phonograph, who owns these old voices and these traditions and that sort of thing. Part of what I would like to do with the archival material is just open it up, right? Open it up. Um, open it up to the people who are asking for access to that historical material. Because what's happened is there's been a great deal of political suspicion of the archive and of you know, monuments. That's healthy and great, right? So what's being asked now is we want a popular or larger community to interpret that material and to do different things with that material, right? And so I think that archival material needs to be opened up. And that's what I'm advocating, not just the sounds and the statues and the, and the manuscripts, but the spaces 
and the way that the West has represented the other and the and um, race, gender, sexuality, all these different things have been codified and turned into laws through to arc due to the archives and the sort of historical record. There's a desire for this to be opened up, expanded, reinterpreted, and I want to be a part of opening it up on lots of different levels, right? I, I agree with that access. I agree with um, uh, the, the biggest the biggest issue with archives is access. Yeah. You know, and uh, as an artist, as a researcher, as a historian, where you have to sign all these complicated forms before <laughs> you have access or before you use, it's uh, it's uh, it's kind of a uh, it's, it's a restriction already. And these are the things, like you say, the the, the, the archives need to be opened up and, and and accessed. You know, like completely, we want full access to that. In your attempts of going beyond the visual, um, Annette mentioned that in her introduction, Emeka. Yeah. You also tried different approach via our taste buds. Yeah. So can you tell us about your experience in, in Castle? I remember coming there as always a documenter. You've seen a thousand things. You enter a new place and somebody gives gives you a glass of beer. And I, at the time, I didn't really understand the artistic approach about that. But yeah. I very much enjoyed the beer. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Uh, well, um, I also I'm I'm also very much engaged or interested uh, with working with taste. You know, really, I think my work these days is uh, encompassing the whole human senses because you don't just leave out one or leave out the rest and focus on one. So my approach as of now is also to um, work with uh, taste. So I would, I would you mentioned the castle, so I will explain a little bit on how uh, the beer came to be or more about the taste of the beer. It's a long story about the Suffahead beer project. So normally um, I, I, I research and convert research into flavors or uh, into flavors and build a recipe out of that. So for the Suffahead castle edition, we did a, we run a research on um, the African uh, presence or the Africans in a castle. And uh, the biggest population of Africans in Kassel are from the Horn of Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, and um, Somalia. So in this sense, um, I wanted to create something that also connects to that place and also connects to Kassel. Uh, chance we have it in, uh, in Ethiopia, there's a, a brew, a med called um, Dutch. It's made from uh, honey. So they brewed honey. It's really this very strong drink, and uh, you don't want to mix it with any other drink, you know. But uh, bottom line is what I find interesting with working with something like honey is if you want to tell a story of a place through taste, honey is one of the biggest, um, uh, <clears throat> one of the main ingredients to do so because honey is made from nectar of flowers. Uh, the bees make honey from nectar of flowers, and these flowers are growing in the soil all over this place. So the story of this place is already encoded in honey. And that's why uh, for, the, for the castle edition, we worked with honey uh, um, as one of the main ingredients. We work with the uh, coffee, um, with, uh, uh, malts like uh, roasted uh, up to the coffee grade. And uh, there were notes of chili in the beer too, because if you ask any African living in Europe about European food, though, like in Germany, it's not sharp enough. It's really, there's no heat in this food. And, uh, so when you are telling the story of this place, especially with the African migrants uh, in this place, um, we put it together, all these ideas and concepts to create the flavor for the beer. So that's what you tested for um, Casa. Did you try that beer, Louis? No, but I'm supposed to go to Berlin in January and I'm sure Emeka will share some. Well, uh, yeah, we still have some, but we have new ones. Uh, we have the one from Basel, we have the one from Paris. It's also the same way of uh, using a space or using your research about a space to um, craft a beer. But like the work num does not stop in the beer. The beer is just an entry point into the into the whole artwork because uh, you also, if you, if you have a product, you have to advertise this product. So part of the research goes into creating advertising I mean, concepts for the beer, yeah. I mean, we also, I mean, you know this, Emeka, but Sound has a strong impact on how things taste. I will tell you a story on that. So um, <laughs> we also made a um, we also made a beer for uh, Munster. Uh, when I when I went to Munster to research for um, sculpture project, 
I wanted to bring Lagos to Munster, but I stumbled upon um, Moondog. You know, if, if anyone, any musician or any uh, knows about, uh, I'm sure you know about Moondog. So he's this American uh, musician, poet. Oh, absolutely. Um, that went to, he's, he disappeared. And many people were like, oh, where is Moondog? Moondog actually ended up living in Munster. He died in Munster, he's buried in Munster. So I shifted my work to creating a piece with uh, Moondog. So actually my sound installation for Moondog sculpture came out uh, well, it's connected to Moondog. And I worked with uh, the only person that plays the trimmer in the world, who's uh, someone that uh, Moondog mentored. But that aside, I, I really wanted to bring Lagos to Munster and, we, and I had this idea to create a beer that is inspired by a Moondog. So we made a beer on Moondog using the lime flower flavor of the trees. But then how do we bring Lagos to, to Munster through this beer? During the fermentation process of the beer, I attached transducers around this fermentation tank and played the Lagos soundscape for the whole fermentation period of, um, of the beer. You know, there have been other theories that uh, people play music in their wine cellars for the yeast to listen to. Yeah, that could work. But for me, I also know like yeast are living beings and I decided to vibrate the yeast. So basically, instead of the yeast being like completely serene and quiet throughout the fermentation uh, period, with the transducers we attached to the fermentation tank, they were vibrating to the sound of Lagos throughout that fermentation period. And uh, did that affect the taste? It's Lagos and the beer. And that's why the beer is called Quiet Storm. Musta is really quiet. The storm is the Lagos and there's a storm in the beer bottle that came from working with sound and fermenting uh, during the fermentation period. Yeah. You know, Christoph, this is a couple of your questions combined. I'm responding to the question about what sound can do, not just in terms of um, taste and memory and, and immersive experience. A lot of what I think we're doing now, those of us involved in sound and politics and race and culture, is we're actually trying to do something that corporate America, at least, and corporate culture has known for a long time, <laughs> right? There is such a long history in, in American sh advertising and shopping and everything from the kind of music played in, in, in stores going back to the early 20th century, right? Advertising and media has understood that sound has a powerful impact on people's habits and people's tastes, and, right? But we haven't actually paid attention to it. Right, which of course is the point. We're not supposed to pay attention to it. Right? So in many ways to, en to engage sound now is to really try to work against this longer history that sound is being used against us in ways that we don't recognize, right? I would like to come back to um, something that you said in the beginning, Louis, that after we listened to Emeka's recordings, um, you commented, well, we're listening to now, but it will probably be forgotten and ignored. And, um, and that brings me back to the question of memorials and monuments. Um, how do you see sound playing a role in creating mon a monument or a memorial or something to remember this incident, to remember the history of the people? And um, because Monument is something, it's, it's an attempt to put something in a public space so that everyone can really experience it in some way. And sound is a very powerful medium. Um, I know a couple of listeners uh, have been writing in questions about, you know, how can you, sound is, is such an immersive medium, how can you use that for, you know, human rights activism, for advocacy, um, and I'm just, I'll just put that out to you. Do you see, you know, how do you see that going out, um, bringing it to the public? Well, I would say that that's what I like to think that that's what I'm trying to do and a Mecca, but also a lot of the sound artists out there. But I think that what's necessary is more attention to this very sphere of sound and politics, right? I feel that we're still pioneering the space of sound in terms of memorials, which is why Christoph, for the Nuremberg project, I'm inviting people to see what they can do to transform it, this immersive experience into something for the public. Now, Annette, I, I, 
I don't think it's impossible to imagine a monument that is purely sonic. I don't think that's impossible to imagine. I just think that we need to take it seriously enough to establish a monument that is purely sonic, right? What would happen then? I know that there are people now, for example, I was at the, the wonderful African-American Museum in DC. They have a whole section where there's vinyl and the museums now have your headphone section and that sort of thing. Even in Berlin, I encountered the headphone sections and all of that, but that's using recordings as a supplement to visual materials. What if your monuments had no visual component? They were just purely sonic. That is very possible now, and people are trying their best to establish that. I think we need to move more in that direction, right? So there's a kind of openness to my thinking around sound and activism and engagement, right? And I think that's a good thing. Right. I don't have an answer to how it should be. I just want more of it to exist. <laughs> well, I, I have an answer to that because I've actually built a sound monument. Um, and, um, I was invited for the Monumental Lab project in uh, Philadelphia a couple of years ago. And uh, it's, it was around this whole question and issue about monument. I mean, what would be the monument for the city? You know, and um, of course, when we think about monuments, we always think about the physical structure, probably a statue and something like that. You know, yes, to create the sound monument, there also has to be a physical uh, stuff because uh, sound is not just traveling uh, independently. It needs a speaker. It needs a sound speaker, or you, it needs a, 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 a material to to uh, um, project the sound. So, but when I was invited for this, I work with sound and I wanted to create um, something different. And so what, what I did was um, there was a questionnaire they put out to the citizens of Philadelphia about what would be an appropriate monument for the city. And they collected all this uh, feedback from people of Philadelphia. And when I was going through this uh, material, I kind of realized that for you to think about a monument, you really have to know your city, you really have to know the history, you have to, you know, like you're talking about, because why do you want a monument? And what will the monument be? To answer that question, you talk about your city and why your city needs a monument or what could be the monument in that sense. So going through this material, I realized that you can tell so much about how the people from Philly feel about the city, uh, how they know the city. So what I did was we ran the material through um, an analytical tool that extracted keywords from, um, from, uh, from this uh, research and uh, also the emotions of these keywords. Then I approached Osula Rocker, who I, I was listening to her poetry before, like before I even got into working as an artist very long time ago in Nigeria. When I realized that Osala uh, lives in a, um, Philadelphia, I was completely blown away. And I approached her like, do you want to be part of this project since you are from Philadelphia? So basically I handed Osala this material and she created a, um, um, a poetry out of it. And um, that is what we installed with um, uh, a, a recompose uh, or rearrange music uh, on the city. Uh, I think it was called uh, Philly Four, Philadelphia Square, uh, Four Squares. And we had a choir, we performed this and had it rearranged by a composer, uh, by a, a composer. And this is what I installed as a monument. So yes, it's a monument of sound and it connects to the city. I think it's very possible. And um, my commission for the African Union a couple of years ago, was also sound installation, you know. But the problem was during the commissioning, of course, everybody wants photo ops and uh, they want them um, something to uh, have at the backdrop as the as for the photography. And there was really nothing, you know, you could just hear the sounds. And these were sounds that I, because uh, I went into the AU archives and found sounds from the past, yes. which were really sounds, uh, uh, recordings from the, from the formation of the African Union. Uh, when it was the uh, organization of the African Union. So this we worked with to reinstall in this space as a, as a monument of sound. So I've tried that a couple of times. And uh, like you said, this is all still new and we'll still keep experimenting and trying to figure okay. it out because from each installation, you sort of realize what could be the issue here. In that yeah. sense, with the, with the AU, it was like, what do we take pictures with? Of course, this 
dignitaries, they are used to having all the sculptures yeah. that they can go behind and take pictures with. This time around, there was nothing for them, you know. Well, I think there's, you know, with the technology and the work being done by artists around installations, you know, in the way that field recorded recording started in this colonial context becomes ethnographic, but now it's the context of art. I think we cannot think of ways to move it from art into more political practice and historical archiving. I can imagine, I can imagine with the new technologies and I've seen artists do, for example, installations based on just the power of bass frequencies, right? Mm -hmm. And what that can do visually, right? The way it moves air and crinkles the air, et cetera. I've seen artists get involved in creating alternate spaces where just based on reverb and sound, you walk into the room and you're disoriented and, right? I want us to spend more time with those kinds of technologies and those kinds of art experiences and see what we could do beyond the gallery space, right? Beyond yeah. the private archival space or gallery space. I want us to sort of go more public and see what we can do with these ideas for public monuments based on sound. I think it will come, it, I think it will come when the technology for uh, loudspeakers uh, becomes completely invisible. Mm -hmm. You know, where we don't have to set up poles or like uh, stop bearing these loudspeakers because that becomes a distraction there. You know, there are technologies where you can use like the transducers and like sure. convert any material you place it on into a uh, loudspeaker, it becomes like hitting. That also works. So- um, Which is what I'm thinking we'll, about. We'll get there. I mean, the transducer is doing that already. Um, and um, I think we're gonna get there because I also use that at the AU where the whole glass screen becomes a loudspeaker uh they don't see any loudspeaker yes it's all the material that you attach uh these vibrating uh speakers to Con sure. then it converts it to loudspeaker so i think part of it is when these equipment becomes completely invisible and you come into a space you just hear the sound without yeah. seeing the, the the stuff that is playing the sound or where the sound is coming from you know, you also have spot speakers and stuff, but when you look up, you're gonna see it, but it's really when the whole space is activated with sound and you don't exactly. see loudspeakers in there. That's really when uh, the monuments will be more powerful, you know. I think we're getting, we're definitely getting there, but you know, a lot of this comes to me because, for example, I was born in Nigeria, but I spent my childhood in Jamaica and a lot of my thinking about sound comes out of Jamaican sound system culture. Those big speakers. Big, exactly, <laughs> but also Emeka, I remember yeah. growing up, and I never took this seriously till I got older. You know, you talk to these sound boys or these sound guys, and they'd say, "You hear that bass tone? That bass tone is not is not from this part of town. That bass tone comes from over there, <laughs> right?" Yeah. And I'm thinking it's just a bass tone. I said, "No, no, 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 no. This is a bass tone from here. That one is from over there, right?" And I found that fascinating. So I thought, if I were to do a monument of sound in a place like Jamaica, a lot of it would have to do with talking to people about how do they define their own bass tone, <laughs> right? And how do we create a monument based on a tone that collectively is recognized as indigenous, right? I find yeah. that fascinating, yeah. but I think that that's the direction that I'm, I'm going in. I'm gonna add a few questions from the audience. Someone asks Julia Hechtmann, I think this is for you, Luis. You were talking about haunting of spaces through sound. And she asks, what do you think such abstraction can provide that immediacy cannot? It's abstraction, but it's also how we process space, right? I mean, to suggest, I don't wanna suggest that abstraction and immediacy are different things. <laughs> right? A part of the way you experience the immediate is through this sort of abstract processing of information, right? And, and physicality, right? So I don't know that one provides something that the other cannot. I think that they both work hand in hand. And so to celebrate immediacy without realizing that part of what makes something immediate is that the physical, the physical is triggered by ideas. <laughs> right? And it triggers memories, right? It triggers associations, which are abstract. 
they all happen at the same time. So I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't say that I would keep them separate. I would say that thus far history attempts to keep them separate. I want to make sure with sound, we bring them together and keep them together. Someone else asks, well, there's a comment about how sound is actually something that you feel with your body, yes, which indeed. is maybe something, I don't know if you want to comment to that as well. Yes, you do. Actually, there was this company here in Berlin that developed this um, band you wear on your wrist and you can feel the bass. Like, you know, it's, 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 it sends a vibration to your body. So you, when you go clubbing, it becomes a, uh, a different experience. It converts the, 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 the base of the music and pulsates it into your body and you feel it. So yeah, you can, you can definitely feel sound minus just the big speakers and stuff like that. This is beyond just like a loud music and stuff. This is really like a vibrating signals that are only activated when a certain pitch or a certain tone is, is, uh, is heard. So yeah, it still needs a kind of medium for you to be able to uh, uh, feel that. But it's, uh, I tried it out. It's really, uh, it's an amazing experience. You know, and there are those uh, who, when they study sound, they're, you know, they'll tell you that Sorry? sound physically transforms your body. I mean, yeah. it's going inside, it's back to that involuntary listening. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's, all it's all frequency, it's all frequency. Yes, exactly. Know? It's actually physically kept, you know, doing things to your body, especially with frequency, pitch and volume. Right, yeah. absolutely. But in, for me, that's, in, connected in, to that's connected to abstraction also because as human beings, you feel something, but you think something about the thing you're feeling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those things happen at the same time. And that's yeah. the power of sound. It's hard to separate abstraction from affect or physical experience. I think there's actually a frequency called the bra frequency. I'm not sure I remember correctly. That's a but myth. That, I've heard about that one for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are the scholar here. You know, but no, no, no. Myth, I don't know if it's true, but I've been hearing myth, it. The myth is that this frequency <laughs> when you hear it, your bowel is gonna give up, you know, and you're gonna, you know, it, it's it's not a good experience. But yeah, it's it's also used by the military. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, there's yeah. a certain pitch. There's a certain there's a certain pitch that is uncomfortable. There's a certain frequency that is uncomfortable to the ears, or there are certain frequencies that can actually blow your eardrums. Absolutely. No, if I, when I say it's a myth, I don't mean it's not true. It's mean that I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> I've not experienced, and I, and I don't want to experience it to be honest. It's, it, would be, it would definitely be embarrassing if you do that. You know? but, um, yeah, totally. But yeah, I mean, there are also certain pulsating beats that your heart connects to like your Absolutely, heart yeah. pounding to this uh, frequency. So yeah, you feel, you feel, you feel sound, you feel music completely. But that's what I was saying earlier though. I mean, the government and, you know, from World War II to the present, they've been using sound for military purposes. Yeah. There's no question that sound does physical things to you, right? There's no question, but, you know. Here's another interesting question that looks to the future. Um, Todd Abrams, writes, in contrast with sound for the past present, I have been starting to work on soundtracking speculative fiction concepts like utopia, green cities. Part of the idea being a focus or target on sound associated with a goal for society to strive towards and be Ooh. inspired by. Are there any thoughts on this area? I, mean, I, I would jump in there to say as, a, as an Igbo person coming from an oral background and tradition, this is really how the society has functioned. You know, yeah. um, the society has been more oral than written down. So here people gather around in village squares and transmit knowledge, history, morals through music, through uh, communal participation and singing, because when you repeat something, it, it becomes ingrained in you. So yes, this is not exactly a new theory, but I see it, I see it like completely something we can put into the future, and, you know, but it, it, it also involves active listening and participation to, to these songs, to this music, to these narrations, to these freestyle speeches. So yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a good direction if we can think about bringing this into the future, definitely, that's a good one. It, it's, it's, it's tough for me personally, just because my politics lean more to the, to the, to the anarchist <laughs> in the sense that I'm a little suspicious of um, a, a, a socially constructed target 
of sound that must that we must all sort of adhere to, right? My, not that there's anything wrong with that. The, the thing about sound is that it generates so many different responses, <laughs> right? That I find it really hard to think of a way to orient it and target it, right? And so I can't answer the question because I don't know how a society, especially a society like ours, which is global, complex, multiple and overlapping can come up with one sound that organizes it. And that may not Moral be- instructions. Huh? Moral instructions, you know? <laughs> well, that's, the, that's where the anarchist in me gets a little worried. <laughs> well, um, I mean, you're right in this sense, but um, like what I wanted to just point out that it's not, a, it's not per se going to be a new thing going on. True. Going forward. It's, uh, it's something that has already been tried out. And that is, I mean, even in that past society, of course, not everyone obeyed those rules or exactly, whatever. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> yes, there will also be the rebels and the anarchists like uh, not making connections to it. It's, it, but it's also almost, it's almost like brainwashing, you know, repetitive. Well, that's, that's what I'm thinking region. about too. And so when I, you know, I like Todd's question. Todd's got, it's, you know, Todd, you're making me think about this because it makes me also wonder about the status quo, you know, pop music and a lot of the values and ideas in pop music. There are people who would say the problem with pop music is that it's giving us a target and a focus and a set of goals that are problematic. And so what you're suggesting is that we need to sort of come up with other ones, which I agree. Maybe not other singular ones, but other multiple ones. Another interesting question we slightly touched before. You talked about an archive of sounds. And uh, our listener asks, when is the right moment to make the recording? I mean, the sound continuously changes. You have out of a sudden airplanes. You might have football games nearby That's in right. Nuremberg. You've seen that. So when is the moment to catch the real authentic spirit of a place? Yeah, that's really tough. Um, I remember when I was recording in Nuremberg, Jan, my collaborator, Jan St. Werner, he said, wow, it looks like you're fishing. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's actually a good description because with me and field recording, you have to spend a lot of time. It's like a lot of, lot of time to just get sections, which you're then picking based on your own values and aesthetics and Etc. But one of the things that you get as a field recorder is that there is no beginning and there is no end. If you're looking for the right start and the right end for a recording, you're gonna, that's never gonna happen. Beginning and end only occurs when you start editing, <laughs> right? Which for some people is a problem and some artists don't wanna do that. But <laughs> beginning and ending is something you impose on sound, right? I will say like you're hundred percent right. There's no beginning and there's no ending. And um, it, it's com it comes down to the field recorder. It comes down to the artist. You know, I'll record like, I'll just keep recording. Then when I go back to the studio, I, I, and then I found specific things that, I, that I could be interesting for me or are connected to what I want to do. Take a city for La uh, like Lagos for an example. If I record 24 hours, uh, on one day and go back and record 24 hours the next day, it's not going to be the same. I mean, you will hear some similarities or whatever, but it's not going to be the same. So there's really no time, you know, it's, it's you know, time is, uh, is relative. At the end of it all, it depends on the field recorder and also the artist. When you get back to your studio, what do you extract from the whole recording? What do you find more interesting? How do you want to tell your story? So there's no beginning and there's no end. The, there's, the time is over. So, anytime you record, works only if you're waiting for a specific kind of sound like in Europe where the church bells tell the passing of time if you want to record that then it's every hour you know so there's really no beginning and there's no end for this we started a bit like the German railway which is slightly too late so that gives us the possibility to also end a little too late so apology but we still have Plenty of people listening and asking very, very interesting questions. One to both of you. You have been working on blind spots of history. We've seen the images of Nuremberg. You mentioned SARS. We had the sounds. 
So how do you actually operate to discover in different parts of the world these blind spots of history? Is it the field recordings? Is it interviews? Is it archival search? How do you proceed? It's, it's a combination of everything. You know, there's research. Um, you find out about a place. Um, actually, most of this information may not even be uh, on history books. So you talk to people from that place. You talk to old folks that experience this. Um, yeah, so it's a combination of everything. It's not one thing and leaving, leaving the other. Then uh, actually you go to record from the field recording. Sometimes you don't even hear something during the process of recording till you go back to listen in your studio and you hear stuff. It's funny, I've actually had a, a, a few uh, recorders that tell me like spooky stories about how they hear something in their recording and for sure they didn't hear it. Ghosts. While recording, uh, while making the recording. And this is backed up because it's not one person. It's probably a bunch of field recorders going to do stuff and they hear it. And I had someone tell me a story that when he records, he can actually record stuff that we will not hear and he plays it back and you hear it. So there's, there's so much out, out there, but to answer that question, it's a combination of everything. There's research, there's a recording, there's, a, there's interviews. Uh, there's also the fluke recordings, you know, things you, you didn't plan, you bump into it. So it's a combination of all. Um, yeah, Emeka's right. It's a combination of everything, including what each field recorder artist brings to the table already. Like I, I have a background in music. And so for me, a lot of field recording is and sound work is to actively work against my musical training because that sets a bunch of habits, rhythm and melody that I don't want anymore, <laughs> right? But I wanna say though, I'm also a scholar. Um, in the academic context. And as a black scholar who studies colonialism and race and racism, you know, you, you, you learn to not accept history. That's kind of what we do. <laughs> as black or minorities, you learn that history is a lie or much of it is a lie, right? You have what one philosopher once called the hermeneutics of suspicion, <laughs> right? You're always suspicious of things. And because of that, I then become, as a writer, suspicious of literature and history and books. I respect those things because I produce those things, but I also know their limits. And that's where I turn to sound, right, to sort of explore the other spaces through interviewing people, researching the place, talking to people. But I love Emeka's point. This whole thing about hearing things you didn't record, that's a big deal. That's a huge deal, man. <laughs> <laughs> there is stuff going on. When I recorded the, um, the last extant slave quarters in the, in the northern part of the United States, it's a recording I'm, I, I still am working with. Call it interpretation, call it wishful thinking, but once you clean up all of the sounds and the distortion and the traffic and the noise, there are weird melodies that are just repeating themselves over and over and over that were not there when I was recording. Now we could technically describe it as maybe just some weird frequencies or what have you. I don't know. That mystery for me is what, is what motivates a lot of my recording. The thing you did not expect to hear, right? That actually would be a fantastic closing statement, but... <laughs> Annette, you've been studying the many questions, which only shows that you are fantastic people to talk to. Anything you would want to throw in again, Annette? Well, maybe just bring it to the audience because someone is asking, well, what can I do? <laughs> um, do you have any suggestions for the audience how to listen, um, how to engage more, how to become more aware? What can I do is always a question I try not to answer. <laughs> It's a tough one, um, and it's also an un, kind of a, a burden that I don't know that I, I'm uh, equipped to carry. But when it comes to sound, I would like to say this. We all listen to music. Um, music should prepare us for sound. Listening to music should prepare you to listen beyond music and to pay attention to the world around you through sound. And, echoes and other voices 
I think that's what music should get you to do. And so if you do listen, in the same way that you spend a lot of time learning how to read properly, I think we don't really think about how to listen properly. And it would be good to find ways to improve that. Or not properly, but at least take it more seriously as a space of meaning, you know, and history. I, I, I would say, um, like, I mean, you said the music, actually music is uh, probably the only thing that you uh, use every part of your brain to, um, to connect with. But I would say, I mean, the easiest thing I always tell people is start with your environment, you know, just write down what you, what you hear. It just makes you more aware of your environment and uh, maybe makes you pay more attention. You know, but listening is also like, uh, depends on the individual. So, but I would really say start with your surrounding at the moment and just write down what you hear. Bottom line, you start paying more attention. You can step out on your street and do that. It's like an exercise on, on listening. That would be a starting point on my recommendation, you know, then you incorporate it into your life, like paying more attention to that, you know. No, we've, answered, are really we've answered the question based on just a humble take on listening. If the, if the question was a larger question about what should we do politically, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a whole nother panel right <laughs> well might be time to round up time to thank you for taking us on your journeys on you made two very very impressive presentations in a very different form thank you so much for that thanks for overcoming all the technical difficulties emeka it was good to be linked to berlin directly it's good to having you as a neighbor, Luis. So look forward to having a beer on Emeka's health, even if it's not made with honey. And maybe we all see to see each other at Next Documenta, which would be fantastic. We mentioned the website, Annette posted it as well. Have a look on the many, many other facets on the shaping of history. I think uh, you two have made it very clear again that history is a construct that you have to be suspicious on all these eternal truths that never last longer than a few years. So yeah, let's, let's stay tuned and work together on the shaping of history.